that is higher than any name, the name of Jesus. The Bible says, at the mention of that name, every knee will bow of beings in heaven, beings in the earth, and beings beneath the earth, that every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a Your name is power, your name is 
within your presence I speak Jesus Father we declare Jesus over every circumstance over every tribulation over every demonic oppression over every sickness and disease that would try to raise its ugly head against your people we speak Jesus into the darkness and command the darkness to be silent in the lives of your people this morning. We thank you for the authority we have in Jesus' name. Glory to Jesus. We want to also thank you for your ongoing faithfulness in giving. You can actually give in three different ways. Simply go to the description portion of this video on YouTube and click on the giving link. This will take you to our website. From there, you can give securely through PayPal. There is no account required. Or you can also download the Givelify app, find Living Faith Church, Exelon, Wisconsin, or simply mail a check or money order to Living Faith Church, P.O. Box 65, Exelon, Wisconsin, 54835. Please remember to pray for our nation and our leaders, along with our LFC missions families in Tanzania, Africa, India, Mexico, and Honduras. Thanks, everyone. Well, this morning, I'm going to give you a rerun. This is the message I preached last night at the gathering. And normally, I don't preach the same message. People always ask me, well, you know, do you sometimes do three services on a weekend? Because we had a Friday night service at Joy Fellowship, and then we had a service at the gathering last night, and then we're having a service today. And so last night, I preached this message but, you know, the thing is, when you preach messages, what a lot of people don't realize is, because I don't, know, I don't just read down my notes, I'm not a preacher that just reads his notes, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> so, what I find when you preach, because preaching has an element of the prophetic in it, at least biblical preaching has an element of the prophetic, because our objective is not to preach out of our head, it's to preach out of our heart. You know, wisdom and knowledge come through your head, come through your mind, through your understanding, and then it goes into the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's the one who lives, lives in us, right? He's the one that takes the things and makes them known to us. So I've found over the years that depending on who you're speaking to, the revelation comes forward based upon who's hearing. And uh, this is why oftentimes, you know, when I preach a lot of times, you know, I say, well, I go down rabbit trails. And the reason I go down rabbit trails is generally because somebody in the congregation, somebody may not, I may not normally don't know anything about who it is, uh, but the Holy Spirit just draws you into where people need to hear things. And so sometimes uh, a word of knowledge will come forth in teaching where I'll talk about something that has nothing to do with what I'm preaching about, and, but it's a word of knowledge being brought out through the gift of the teacher. And so... This morning, even though this is the same message, you know, you know, I just want you to realize, you know, okay, are we having leftovers again here this morning? So, no, we're not having leftovers. We're having divine encounters with God this morning. Amen? Uh, the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said, A message has never reached perfection until you've preached it at least 50 times. Now, I don't know if I've ever preached any message 50 times. So, praise be to God. There's, there's nothing new under the sun but there's always new revelation on what is under the sun. Amen? So this morning, I just want to talk to you a little bit about changing times. One, the two of the subjects that I preach every year, almost without fail, are faith, because we need to hear faith. You know, you can be in faith one day and out of faith the next day. Amen? Peter was walking on the water one moment. The next moment, he's looking around at the circumstances and sinking. And we fall into that, right? You can, you can fall into So I don't care how much you hear faith. Faith comes by hearing, not having heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith is one of those areas of our lives that we need to maintain our faith. 
because it's easy in a world of darkness, it's easy in a world of turmoil, it's easy in a world of difficulty to get our eyes off of God and get our eyes on our circumstances. So we are called to be people of faith. And so I preach on faith a lot because we're a faith church. Our motto is stand firm in faith. And uh, so if you're going to stand firm in faith, you need to know how to stand firm in your faith, right? You need to know what that means. So I preach on faith a lot. And uh, every, every area of our lives, every aspect of our lives has something to do with the faith that God has put within us. Somebody said that faith is the thread of the fabric of the Christian life. In other words, it weaves through every single element of our lives. And so we need to hear faith a lot. Uh, and especially in the days we're living in, you better be people of faith. Amen? Because faith is the victory that overcometh the world. We live by faith. We walk in faith. Eventually, we're going to die in faith. Amen? So faith is important. But another area I preach on every year is the end times. Now, since I've been a believer, I got saved in 1982, and ever since I've been a believer, I've studied end time events. I've, I've been a Bible prophecy preacher for many, many years. And when I got saved in 1982, as I said last night, everybody was talking about the end times. Everybody was talking about the second coming of Christ. It was just a very popular subject, at least in the circles that I ran in. And, of course, end-time teaching has always been very popular, as it should be, in many circles. Now, it's, that is not true throughout the entire body of Christ by any means, but it's obvious it's a very important or a popular subject. Um, it even is popular among lost people because there wouldn't be all of these disaster movies and end-of-the-world movies out if, if, if it weren't popular. Because ultimately, people, people have this beliefs about, you know, things that we're living in are coming to an end. I think God built within us the understanding that the age we live within is not going to last forever. And that's true. We're living in an age that is going to pass away. And we're looking for a new age, a new kingdom. And the Bible says about those prophet, those believers of old in Hebrews chapter 11, it says some of them did not receive deliverance because they, they testified that they looked for a city whose builder and maker is God and that this world was not worthy of them. What is the word there? It's the age, the age in which we live in. And so the scripture has a lot to say about the end of the age and uh, about standing firm in your faith until the end of the age, until you receive your prize. So end time teaching has been very popular in among believers and, and non-believers. Um, but um, I like to talk about the end times. I think it does several things. First of all, we have to remember that God gave us end time teachings not to scare us, but to prepare us. Amen? You know, if you're driving down the road and you see a sign that, um, you know, something's up ahead, what is that sign there for? It's there to get your attention, but it's also to get you to anticipate that there's something happening up ahead. So that sign isn't there to scare you, it's there to prepare you, it's there to get your attention. Well, the Bible is full of signs that are there to get our attention. Events, prophetic utterances, warnings. Throughout the, test, throughout the scripture, we hear prophetic utterances that God is trying to get his people's attention and the people of the nation's attention so that they'll begin to think about God, they'll begin to prepare for God. And so God does nothing, the Bible says God does nothing unless he first reveals it to the prophets and apostles. So everything that's going to happen in the earth that has happened and is going to happen, God is going to reveal these things to us. So God doesn't want us to be ignorant. God doesn't want us to be in the dark. The Bible actually says that, that those who are in, get, drunk, get drunk in the dark, but we're not in the dark that those days should overtake us like a thief. In other words, the things that are coming upon the earth, the things of the end time should not should not take us by surprise. We shouldn't go, oh my goodness, I wasn't prepared for this. Because the objective is we should be watching and waiting and anticipating the second coming of Christ. And just in case you think that, well, Bible prophecy really isn't that important. I don't know why we're even talking about it. You know, what will be, will be. Well, it's important because God says it's important. There is more in the New Testament about the second coming of Christ than any other subject in the New Testament. Jesus gave great amounts of teaching to his second coming. He talked about it all the time. He gave us the parable of the foolish bridesmaids. 
where he says, you know, don't be like the foolish bridesmaids who didn't have enough oil for their lamp. And then the day of the Lord came, the bridegroom came, and they weren't aware, they weren't prepared. Throughout the, throughout the teachings of Jesus, he was constantly telling us, constantly telling the people in his generation, that first generation, to be awake, be on guard, be alert, don't fall asleep, don't be caught up in the things of this age, and, and so that you miss the coming of the Lord. And he said, I'm going to come in an hour, you're not prepared for me. So be awake, be on, be on guard. And uh, so Jesus taught about the second coming a lot. The Apostle Paul certainly taught about it a lot. The Apostle Peter spoke about it. The Apostle John spoke about it. So I think if Jesus spoke about it and the Apostles spoke about it, and our faith is built upon the doctrine of the Apostles and Prophets and the Holy Scriptures, then we should be thinking about it, right? It's an important subject. It's an important subject, especially for us in this hour. Now, the first century church truly believed that Jesus was going to return in their generation. And, of course, he didn't. It's been 2,000 years, over 2,000 years since Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead and uh, was ascended up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the majesty and high. And we remember in the book of Acts that when his disciples stood by Jesus and they saw him go up into the clouds up into heaven to sit down at the Father's right hand. It was his last ascension because he spent 40 days on the earth after his resurrection talking with his disciples. He'd show up and give people instruction and then he was taken out of their sight before the day of Pentecost and taken up into glory. And two angels stood by and they said, you men of Jerusalem, why do you stand staring into the sky? This same Jesus whom you see go will come in like manner. And what did Jesus himself say? He said he was going to come in the clouds with glory. So when Jesus returns, he's coming in the clouds with all the hosts of heaven, that's the angelic host and every believer who has died in Christ up until this point, to the point of his return, and he's going to come in the clouds of glory, and the Bible says every eye will see him. And the rich men of the earth and the, the rulers of the earth will cry out for the rocks to hide them from the face of him who sits upon the throne and from the Lamb, because it's going to be a great day. You know, the return of Christ is going to be glory for the believer. It's going to be terror for the unbeliever. It's going to be glory for those who are right with God. It's going to be terror for those who aren't right with God. And that's why we need to be right with God. Amen? But God gave us great, great exhortation regarding these days. And I, I want to read a scripture out of third, uh, Second Peter chapter 3. And I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation, which is a more modern translation. And Peter, by the Spirit of God, is speaking to, his, to us. And he says, but the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Now, once again, we hear, you know, he's coming like a thief in the night. Well, what's the implication there? A thief comes when you're not looking for them, right? A thief comes at night. A thief comes, and Peter says he's coming like a thief in the night. But we have to recognize that we as God's people should understand that God's intention is not for him to come into our lives or come and us be overtaken like it's a thief in the night. Because sometimes God's people can have this kind of pleading stupidity and think, well, you know, he's coming like a thief. Oh, nobody knows. Well, again, God has given us signs so we can know. If God didn't want us to know, then why would he even bother giving us signs? Why did Jesus spend a lot of time talking about these are the things to look for? Why did Paul talk about in the very last end of the age, this is the condition of society? God gave us all these things. Even the Apostle John was given the, the, the entire revelation and all the Old Testament prophets who spoke of the end of the age, they were given these things so that we'd be watching, we'd be waiting, we'd be anticipating his coming. God doesn't want us to be ignorant. God doesn't want us to be caught off guard. God wants us to be watching and waiting. But Peter says here, but the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. So what is he saying here? This earth is going to be consumed in the fire of God. So looking at this age and considering that everything in this age is eventually going to be consumed, what kind of people should we be? So what is Peter basically saying here under inspiration of the Holy Spirit? He's basically saying, don't get too attached to this age. Right? Don't get too attached to this age. Because it's all going to go up in a flame. It's all going up in smoke. Except for the things that have eternal value. 
But he says you're looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. So when I talk about end times, I don't get scared. I get excited. I get anticipating. Uh, you know, I don't think these are the scary times of the boogeyman and the Antichrist. This is the end of the age where God is going to show his glory like never before in the history of the world. Yes, these are going to be perilous times. Yes, these are going to be difficult times. But, you know, sometimes we look at these things from a very American perspective when we have to recognize that there have been difficult times throughout the ages. Since Jesus arose from the dead, guess what? His people have been suffering great persecution all over the world. It's just that in America we haven't suffered much persecution. But in other countries, people are suffering the very things that Jesus foretold that they would suffer for their faith in Christ. So he goes on, he says, But we are looking forward to a new heavens, a new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make sure or make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember our Lord Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him, speaking of these things in all of his letters. So Peter is saying Paul talked about these things. So what is he saying here? He's saying that we need to make sure that as we see the day of Christ approaching, that we're examining our lives, that we're living a godly life. We don't want to be caught up in this world. We don't want to end up getting caught up in the darkness of this age. And, you know, we don't want to be of the mindset like I can just go out and live in sin and darkness and, you know, someday I'll get my life right with God before Jesus comes back or someday I'll get my life right with God before I die because you may get caught off guard. You know, people die all the time. 150,000 people on this planet approximately die every day. And most of those people, I would venture to say, are not preparing to die that day. So we need to be awake we need to be examining our lives. We need to make sure that we live with eternity in our hearts, realizing that the hour and age we live in was never intended to be our eternal home. Our eternal home is with God. Our eternal home is in the kingdom that is to come. And I believe within Christianity in the West, especially in the United States of America, and we heard kind of a strong rebuke from our sister Elaine reading out of Ezekiel's word to the nation of Israel. And... Um, I believe that we need a serious paradigm shift in Christianity in America. I think about Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Jeremiah was not a very old man. He was quite young. And the Lord told him to go give a message to the nation of Israel. And the message was, this was the southern kingdom of Judah. The message was that because of their sin, God was raising up their enemy Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire to come in and he was going to come into Jerusalem and he was going to haul them away into captivity for 70 years so that the land could rest because they had not obeyed God they had fallen into sin and Jeremiah stands up and he's called by God to give this message that is extremely unpopular it's really an unpopular message because basically the king when he gives him the message the king takes his decree and burns it up in the fire just ignores it and they end up locking Jeremiah in a pit, and he's, you know, he's persecuted severely. He's considered a traitor. He's considered, you know, you're, you're colluding with our enemies because you're speaking things we don't want to hear. And Jeremiah basically says, you know, if you do what God wants you to do and you cooperate with Nebuchadnezzar and the king of, of the Chaldeans, things will go well with you. Go up and get, you know, go back up to Babylon and settle down in the land and, and live your life there. And then after 70 years, I'm going to bring you back into the land. He gives them hope. But he definitely tells them that they need to realize that God is turning them over to their enemies. And, uh, but he says, if you don't cooperate, he's going to slaughter you. And of course, the sad commentary is they don't cooperate because they're not used to listening to what God says anyhow. And they do get slaughtered. And he carries them away into Babylon, into captivity. So Jeremiah, like us, is looking at all the evil that's going on in the land of Israel. And he's troubled by the unrighteousness. He's troubled by the injustice of the land among people that profess to be God's people. And uh, he's complaining to God about this. And he says, you know, 
all of this stuff is happening and it doesn't really look like you're doing anything. Why is it taking you so long to bring judgment? Why are you taking so long? Because Jeremiah sees the injustice. It bothers him and he's, he's vexed by the wickedness he's seeing in his own people. And he says, Lord, people are being abused. People are being mistreated. The poor are being oppressed. And why don't you do something about it? And then the Lord gives Jeremiah a rebuke. And we find this in Jeremiah 12, 5, and it says, and I'm reading this out of the Amplified, it says, The Lord rebukes Jeremiah for his impatience, saying, If you have raced with men on foot, and they have tired you, then how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in the land of peace, where you feel secure, then how will you do among the lions in the flooded thickets beside the Jordan? So, in essence, what is God saying? Jeremiah, if you think... If you're having a hard time contending with things the way they are right now, how are you going to contend with things when they get really tough? And I think this is a really good word that we need to, we need to take to heart. I've, I've heard this word a number of times from the Lord because we live in a land of abundance. We live in a land of peace. We as Americans have experienced unprecedented peace in our lifetime. Now, we have had wars. We've had World War II. We had the Civil War. We had uh, the Korean War. We had the Gulf Wars. We had the Vietnam Wars. We had Afghan Wars and a number of wars. But you and I realize that we, we re really should realize that the life we have lived in this era has been an anomaly. It's been unprecedented. We have experienced unprecedented peace, tranquility, and safety when we compare America to the rest of the nations. We have never had a foreign army invade our country. If you think of many countries around the world, numerous countries have been invaded time and time again by foreign armies. They've experienced uh, difficulties like we have never experienced. You know, we know and we continue to want to admonish you to pray for Israel. We'll pray for Israel before we leave today and what's going on over in Jerusalem. And, um, but it's hard for us as, America, as people in this country to kind of relate to those things when you're not living with bombs going off in your neighborhood, when you're not living with years upon years upon years of, of families and friends being blown to bits by terrorists and living in a very difficult land. But that's the, that's the case with a lot of nations on the planet right now, and it has been for many, many years. And so the, the admonition I want to just put out to you and, and myself, I'm speaking to myself as well, if we think about us as Americans, if we can't live for God now, how are we going to live for God when things really get tough? You know, if we're afraid to stand up and proclaim the gospel right now, what are we going to do when it costs us something? And I mean, there's a wonderful book by Eric Metaxas. It's called Letter to the American Church. And Metaxas goes back to Eric Metaxas. And he studies uh, the Lutheran church in, in pre-Nazi Germany. And when Hitler was coming to power and the Nazis were taking power. And the position and posture of the church in Germany was predominantly, let's stay neutral. We don't want to engage in politics. We don't want to raise our voices in opposition to what Hitler is doing. And then, of course, it became more and more difficult to do it. There were a few pastors. Bonhoeffer was one of them that was standing up and saying, this uh, socialistic, uh, Hitler socialism is not a good thing. We should not be embracing these things. He saw what was going on, and he began to raise red flags. But the church as whole was much like the church in America, and this is the, the comparison that Metaxas raises that, that this nonsense that we've postured ourselves in in the church for the most part in America to stay out of politics, stay out of anything controversial. We don't want to raise our voices. We, want to, you know, we just want to be like sheep that go along. And uh, I would say we're like sheep to the slaughter is what we are. And, and not raise our voices. And unfortunately, this has become the posture of many American pulpits in America where pastors don't want to speak out because, you know, I've got people of various political persuasions, and if I say this, then they're going to get mad and leave my church. And if I say this, they're going to get mad and leave my church. Well, you know, I kind of let that thing go a long time ago because you cannot straddle the fence. Truth is truth. Righteousness is righteousness, and a lie is a lie. And, and if you're on the wrong side of the fence, then you either need to repent or heed the word of the Lord. That's the bottom line. We don't want to capitulate, and we certainly don't want to accommodate this ungodly culture. 
And that's what's happening in the church in America. We have preachers and churches accommodating the culture all the time. And eventually, the more you accommodate the culture, the more you begin, to, uh, you begin compromising the integrity of the word of God. And this is how you end up in apostasy. And this is why much of the church in America is either in apostasy or on the verge of apostasy. Because when you begin to let the culture tell you how you live for God or what is truth instead of the living word of God as your authority, you are on a slippery slope of no return. And this will be the demise. And this is why Jesus in the book of Revelation, when he speaks to the churches through John, seven churches of the Revelation, some of the churches he commends and some of the churches he strongly rebukes. But one of the things he says repeatedly in the letters, letter of the Revelation is he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. He who has an ear to hear. What does that mean? It means if you have a posture to listen to what God's saying, then you better pay attention and listen. Amen. And Lord knows we want to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. We need to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Now, the Apostle Paul was speaking to young Timothy in 2 Timothy. And 2 Timothy is quite interesting because 2 Timothy's tone is so different than 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, God is saying, Paul, by the Spirit of God, is writing to Timothy. And he's basically giving Timothy pastoral advice. Timothy is a young pastor. He's young believers. He's the son of Paul in the faith. And Paul sends him to Ephesus to straighten out Ephesus because you know there's a lot in the Bible about the city of Ephesus and the church in Ephesus the church in Ephesus was the biggest church in in the first century it was a huge church but it had also fallen into I mean within a few years of Christ being raised from the dead the church at Ephesus had fallen into doctrinal error they had gotten into worshiping and angels praying to angels and a lot of whacked out stuff that wasn't biblical and so Paul sends Timothy over to Ephesus to be their pastor to kind of bring them back into line with what Paul had laid as a foundation in that church and that's why he tells Timothy you know don't be intimidated because you're young but be an example to the flock of God in the way you live and uh, Timothy is a direct disciple of the apostle Paul and so he speaks under the authority of the apostle Paul but in 1 Timothy, Paul is giving Timothy some pastoral advice, like this is how you appoint elders. These are the qualification for leaders in your church. These are the qualification for people that stand in positions of authority in your church. They need to be held to a standard, and Paul is giving him all of that advice. But in 2 Timothy, it's a very different tone. In 2 Timothy, first of all, Paul knows that he's about ready to be martyred. His time is very short. And in 2 Timothy, I believe we get this kind of tone and I like to think of it this way because Paul uses in 2 Timothy as he does throughout his letters a lot of military terminology like he tells Timothy suffer endure hardship like a good soldier you know and so I, I get this kind of tonality with Paul as you read 2 Timothy that Paul it's much like a, a brigade of soldiers that are about ready to go in battle to, the next morning and many of them know they're not going to come out alive and their commanding officer is basically telling them now when you go into battle it's going to be really difficult and most of you probably won't survive if any of you survive but we have a duty to fulfill because of our commanding officer and we're going into battle whether we survive or not that's kind of the tone we have here and so we understand that from wars and, and combat, that this is often the case in, in numerous wars where whole brigades of people and platoons of people have to go into conflict and, and they know they're probably not going to survive, yet they do it anyhow because they are obeying orders. They're obeying their commanding officer. And so Paul is giving Timothy this exhortation. And look what it says here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And again, I'm reading this out of the Amplified. And he says here, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Now, that's a powerful statement. I'm charging you. In other words, I'm giving you orders, like a commanding officer, right? Who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing uh, and his kingdom. Do you notice here end time language Paul is using? Because Paul was always talking about the end times. And he says, preach the word. And I love how they put in here, as an official messenger. 
I love that commentation on that word. Preach the word. Be ready when the time is right and even when it is not. Keep your sense of urgency, whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether convenient or inconvenient, whether welcome or unwelcome. Correct those who are in error in doctrine or in behavior. Warn those who are in sin. Exhort and encourage those who are growing towards spiritual maturity. With inexhaustible patience and faithful teaching, for the time will come, now listen, this is what Paul's saying, for the time will come, when people will not tolerate sound doctrine and accurate instruction that challenge them with God's truth. But wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing, they will accumulate for themselves many teachers, one after another, chosen to satisfy their own desires and to support the errors they hold, and will turn their ears away from the truth and will be wandered, will wander off into myths and man-made factions or fictions and will accept the unacceptable. But as for you, be clear-headed in every situation. Stay calm and cool and steady. Endure every hardship without flinching. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the duties of your ministry. Notice what he says. There's a lot in here about duty and charging you and ordering you. So Paul is saying to this young man who is going to face a really difficult situation, and Paul knows this. Paul knows Timothy is going to, he's going to be in for a firestorm, and Paul is trying, Paul is not wanting to give him something that's easy. Paul is not saying to him, you know, Timothy, uh, it's going to be tough, but, you know, just kind of go with the flow. No, he's saying stand fast. In other words, he's saying to Timothy, have a backbone. Have a backbone. Stand steadfast. And he tells him, he tells him and warns him up front, he says, the hour is coming where people don't want to hear what you're saying. Now, I don't know about you, but we've been preaching this for many years. I think you could look around at America and you could see we have this issue in our culture today where people do not want to hear truth. We, we hear this statement that hate, truth is hate to those who hate the truth. I mean, we, we have a culture, and, and unfortunately, whether we want to admit it or not, the culture has come into the church. The culture has come into Christian circles. And so we have a lot of Christians, a lot of professing Christians, a lot of people that profess to be Christians that no longer want to hear strong truth. Now, I think this is what I'm talking about, that we need a major paradigm shift in the body of Christ in America. I think we have become so inebriated, so consumed with feel-good Christianity that we have no concept of what true biblical Christianity is anymore. And I think the time has come that the church has a shift in posture from all of this fluff of feel good, you know, everything's fine, everything's going to be hunky-dory, everything's wonderful, because that's what they wanted to hear in Jeremiah's messages. They wanted to hear everything was wonderful, everything's going to be great. That's what they wanted to hear. Just keep on with business as usual. Que sera, sera. And I think, I think we heard Sharam Hadian say this when he was here, that, you know, if you go around the country and you look at many of the American churches, that, that unfortunately, and I'm not, I'm not trying to slam pastors, I'm not trying to slam pastors, but he said, you know, many pastors really have no clue of the time they're living in. We imagine that everything's just going to continue on as it has from the foundation of the world. And this is exactly what Paul the Apostle Apostle by the Spirit of God in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians spoke to us. He said that people will say peace and safety, and then all manner of destruction will come upon them, like a woman having a baby. Well, think about the statement. Jesus used that same terminology. He said, it'll be like a woman having a baby. Well, you know, here again, going back to putting two and two together because there's ditches people fall into. One of the ditch that people fall into is, oh, you know, Pastor Tim, we got lots of time. I, you know, I really don't want to hear about this end time stuff because they've been saying that for years and Jesus hasn't come back. And I think we've got lots of time. And, uh, you know, I, I, just, I just think when we get there, we'll figure it all out. Well, you know, if your wife is nine months pregnant, you ought to know she's pregnant. And if she's about ready to have that baby, you know, Riley and Kether just had a baby not long ago. And you know how the routine goes. When you get long and you get toward the time of that baby, you don't go on a hunting trip to Alaska somewhere where you're out in the boondocks, right? You stay pretty close to home where you need to be because at any time that baby could be born. And when the baby begins to be born, it's coming whether you like it or not, whether it's convenient or not. 
The time is going to come where the birth pains are going to come, and whether you like it, whether you think it's convenient, it's going to come upon the earth in such a manner that it's going to, we've been waiting, 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 bam, it's here. But if we fall asleep and we act, oh, you know, I'm tired of hearing this end time stuff because Jesus hasn't come back. And that's what Peter said. He said, people will come in the sloth saying, where is the sign of his coming? You know, but I will guarantee you the signs are more evident today than they've ever been of the return of Christ and the end of the age. And we're living closer to the end of the age than ever in the history of our world. And so one of the reasons God gives us these road marks or these things that we should look for is so that we understand what we're seeing. I heard somebody say, you know, uh, you need to get yourself a conspiracy friend so you know what's going on. <laughs> I think that's good advice. Because there's so many people in this country that don't have a clue as to what's really going on. Even if I wasn't a Christian, even if I wasn't a Christian and I actually looked around and see what's going on, we're not in a good situation. We're not in a good situation as a nation. Now, I believe God will sustain us. One of my prayers is even in times of difficulty, we will enjoy plenty. I believe, and I've said this for many years, I believe northern Wisconsin is going to be one of the Goshen areas that God is going to raise up to protect people. I've been saying for years, I believe God is going to bring people from many cities into the North Woods, into this region, this area, because I believe when things begin to fall apart, big cities are going to be the worst place to live on the planet. And they are going to fall apart. This is inevitable. Even if I wasn't a Christian, even if I didn't believe in end time preaching, just looking th at things 2 plus 2 equals 4, 30 trillion dollars, 200 and more trillion dollars in obligatory debt, borrowing money from China every six months just to keep the wheels running, that is a, that is a recipe for complete disaster. Right? Just from a natural perspective. It's just a matter of when, where, and how. How long are we able to keep this ship afloat? Well, we understand one of the things that's going to happen, and you have to realize this, is the government is going to eventually completely collapse the dollar so that we are able to, they're able to usher in a global digital currency. And uh, again, you don't want to get scared. You want to get prepared. And, and there's some of these things that, you know, okay, Pastor Tim, what do we do to prepare? Well, we're going to share some of that later on. I'm not going to share it today, but I do believe some of the things we need to get prepared. And I'm not a financial advisor. I, I, you know, I'm not a person like go out and buy gold. I'm not sure even that is really. But one thing I do know, one thing I definitely know, is we definitely need to store things up. We definitely need to have more food on hand than we have. Because these globalists want to kill you. They want to decrease. It's like Ebenezer Scrooge. If they die, they die and decrease the surplus population. Because that's what they're wanting to do. They want to kill about most of the planet off and bring it down to about 500 million people. So everything they're doing is not to help you. It's to kill you. It's to get rid of you. And uh, we could go in great depth about that. But the point of the matter is... I think one of the things we need to do, and I'm going to share more about this later on when I get into sharing about the Joseph strategy, is I believe God wants us to go back to the way we used to live. Now, that's a very difficult thing, but we need to know where our food comes. We cannot continue to depend on food from across the globe to come into our hand. We need to return to what we used to be. And we may say, well, how in the world are you ever going to do that in this economy? It's very challenging. But if, you do, if we do not prepare for it and we do not start changing on, in living by an alternative economies where we know our neighbors, we can trust our neighbors, we can help our neighbors, we can build local communities again where, where local counties and local families and local communities can buy from one another, can help one another, can support one another. I believe that's what we have to go back to because really this shift has only taken place in my lifetime. When I grew up, you'd, you had local communities, local stores. You, there was no such thing as Walmarts and Amazon and online trading and all this stuff. It was just local people. And so that's not that long ago. I'm not 300 years old here. So we can go back to these things. It's just the reason we don't is because it's so convenient. And it's so seductive. 
And it's difficult to unplug from that system because it is convenient. But therein, of course, is the Alistair Huxley, the Huxley book, Brave New World, or 1984, because Huxley's whole premise of his book was the world will not be run by totalitarianism. It will be run by what seduces us. The world will be run by our pleasures. That we're drugged and it, they feed us pleasure so that we can't rebel. We can't do anything. We can't stand up. And really, I think this is where we're at as Americans, is we love comfort and pleasure so much, we don't have any backbone to fight against anything anymore. Well, some of us do. Some people do. So, but God, Paul was saying to Timothy, he said, the time is coming where people won't want to hear the truth. People, and this is a problem in Christianity. It really bothers me. I think there has been so much emphasis in preaching over the last few decades about people. And it's all about people, don't get me wrong, but, but so much of American Christianity has become so narcissistic self-help and how you your best life now and it's all about you and and what about you well you know I kind of get to the point after a while where do we get to the point where we're recovered instead of forever recovering you know I think the best way to recover is go out and do something with your life start looking around at other people and their needs you know, if you're sitting around for God to save you and like, oh God, when you heal me and when you make me feel better, I'll go out and do something with my life. And in the meantime, I'm just waiting here until you do something with my life and then I'll go out and do You'll never do anything. You know, Jesus, when he healed the lepers, it says, as they went, they were healed. Go out and do something with your life. Serve your neighbor. Find, some, find a hurt and heal it. Find a need and lift it. You know, we, we, we need to get our eyes off of us. We need to get our eyes off of me, myself, and I because we're so consumed in this culture and it's not entirely our fault. We've been seduced by the spirit of the age because the spirit of the age has propagated us with all this nonsense from Hollywood and media for decades about consumerism and you got to have this new phone and you got to have this new car and you got to have this new house and you got to have this new stuff and if you don't have it, you're a loser, L. You know, what is it, L7, loser? You know, shows how old I am. Amen. But you know what I mean. And we've been just feeding on this stuff like pig slop for decades. And, and now we're losing our kids and we're losing our generations because they're just consumed with this darkness. And so it's time, you know, we're finally waking up and saying, how do we put the brakes on here? How do we stop this? How do, how do we unplug from this, this drug that, we've been pulled into. And I don't care what age you are, uh, almost all Americans, we've been drugged by this darkness. It's very seductive. So Paul says to Timothy, uh, you won't have ears to hear. Now, Jesus said something like this because the Pharisees, the Sadducees asked him for a sign and he says, you will be ever hearing in Matthew chapter 13, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. But this people's heart has become calloused they hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. So that generation in Jesus' day, Jesus gives them a very strong rebuke and he says, you don't want to hear. You don't want to hear what I have to say. As a matter of fact, Jesus said to, to the Pharisees, he said, you are hypocrites. You can look out your window. You can say, hey, you know, look at the sky. It's going to be a stormy day or today is going to be a nice day. You can tell the weather but you can't tell the sign of the times. And I, I just want to admonish you in the same respect. You know, think about America. Think about our country. We have entire stations dedicated to the weather. Now, I don't know about you, but it's a habit, and I like to know it. I probably got it from my dad because my dad, every time he'd come home at night from work, he said, I want to watch the weather. And, of course, when I'm a kid, it's like, the weather? What's the watch the weather? <laughs> well, now every morning when I get up, I want to see what the weather's doing. <laughs> so, but you know, we have weather apps on our phone. We have, and we love hearing about the weather. What's the weather going to do? Why do we look at the weather? Because we want to know what's coming, right? And in the same respect, 
We should be that way about the end of the age. What's the end of the age app saying today? What's, what's going on in the world today? You know, what's going on out my window here today? Oh, nothing's happening. Storm clouds on the horizon. Let's go have a picnic. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of how much of the church has postured itself. Like, oh, we're seeing all these things taking a place around us. Oh, oh yeah, things are getting a little bad. But, but you know, God'll, God's got it under control. How many Christians have you heard? You know, I think God's in control. We've been sold that Calvinist hogwash for so long that we're drunk with it what do I mean by Calvinistic hogwash no dis well it is disrespect by Calvinist brothers I guess but what do I mean by that this idea or this doctrine that everything that happens is the will of God and we have nothing to do we just sit by because ultimately we're not going to change it anyhow we're just going to go with the flow and God's just going to you know God's in control of everything good bad ugly indifferent so what's happened, it's caused the church, like the church prior to Hitler, to take this very neutral posture. You know, the way I preach used to be the way most preachers preached. Do you know that? Because I hear people say, you know, it's good to hear a preacher that will stand up for the truth and call things, you know, what it is. That's the way most preachers used to preach. I'm just preaching, I'm just doing what I've always done and most preachers have done. Because years ago, preachers weren't afraid of speaking truth. They weren't afraid of offending everybody. That's why we had hellfire and brimstone preaching. Rip the hide off you, brother. You're on your way to hell, you better repent right now. And if I need to hold a torture of you to get you to feel it, then repent. <laughs> And, and you know, and I'm not saying that was all good, but the reality is this is, we need preachers to stand up and tell their congregations, hey guys, there's a storm on the horizon. We got to stop singing everything's going to be all right because it's not. It's not going to be all right. Ultimately, it will be all right because ultimately our hope is in Jesus Christ. See, even if we die, we go to the house. Even if all H-E double hockey sticks breaks out around us, God is with us. Think of the early church, the first century church. They faced the full storm of the, of the hurricane of the Roman Empire. It was only a few years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ where the Roman Empire looked at Christians as being enemies of the state and enemies of the state religion and began to kill Christians openly, made it illegal to be Christians. They spread all kinds of lies about Christians. And it got so bad that they began rounding Christians up, put, taking them and putting them in the arena and feeding them to the wild beast and killing Christians. Christians. Nero hung Christians on crosses all over his gardens, put pitch all over them and lit them on fire and drove around in his chariot naked singing and playing his fiddle while Rome burned. Nero was a demonic madman. The first century church considered Nero the antichrist of their hour. And, pinch, uh, uh, and offering a pinch of incense to the Roman gods was the essential first century church version of the mark of the beast so the first century church endured the full onslaught of the roman empire's persecution against them and yet in the middle of that christianity spread immensely in spite of persecution in spite of difficulties and throughout the ages christians have been persecuted there's 52 nations on this planet right now 52 and next month we have the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church that we remember every November and our mission's focus for, for November is always the persecuted church, remembering our brothers and sisters who are in chains and reminding ourselves that we're to remember them as though we are chained ourselves because the persecuted church in the West is the forgotten church because the media here doesn't talk about persecuted Christians because it doesn't fit their narrative. Because their narrative, because they're anti-Christ, anti-Christian, their narrative is that it's the Christians who are persecuting everybody. And so they don't like the idea of telling people that no, it's actually, it's actually the Muslims and the Hindus and other people that are persecuting Christians around the world. And so we remember the persecuted church, but 52 countries on the planet right now is, carries with it the death sentence if you convert to Christianity, 52. That's a lot of countries. Become a Christian, you'd be imprisoned, 
and he could be put to death. So Jesus rebuked the leaders of his generation about their unwillingness to hear the truth, their unwillingness to listen. And we see this, this repeat over and over and over. The first generation, Jesus was basically seeing, saying that you should recognize the time of your visitation. You should recognize that the Hebrew prophets and the scriptures foretold my coming. As a matter of fact, what did Jesus do? What did God do before Jesus came? He sent John the Baptist, John the baptizer. And what was John's responsibility? What was he called to do? Prepare the way of the Lord. Make a highway for our God. A voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Do you realize that God is in the same respect sending forerunners in this age like the spirit of that was on John the Baptist to do what? Prepare the way of the Lord. Get ready for his coming. Prepare, he's coming. And what was John's message to the church? What was John's message to the Jewish people in that hour? It was repentance. It wasn't God has a better plan for your life. John said, the Lord is coming and his winnowing fork is in his hand and he's going to gather the wheat into the barns and he's going to throw the trash out and he's going to burn it with unquenchable, feet, with unquenchable heat. John's message was a message of repentance. Turn from your sin and turn to God. And that's the message that Jesus is sending to the church in this hour because if you read the book of Revelation especially and you look at Jesus' admonition to all the churches, he always said the same thing to the churches that weren't living for him. He said, repent. Repent, turn from your sin, go back and do the first works, turn away from this darkness. And yet repentance is a, a word that the American church doesn't even have in its vocabulary anymore. It's all like, accept Jesus, accept Jesus, say a sinner's prayer, accept Jesus, accept the only thing with accepting Jesus is you better repent. Sin and repentance are major doctrines, major themes of the New Testament, no, major themes of the Bible. Because God commands all men everywhere to repent. That means turn away from your sin. You cannot become a believer in Jesus Christ and just add Jesus to your sinful, dark lifestyle. You're just a whitewashed sepulcher. You're like the sow that's washed from its wallowing in the mire. You'll go right back to the pig slop. That's why God said you've got to get washed in the blood of the Lamb. You got to be cleansed in the blood. We sang that song this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. I once was a wretch. I remember who I was. Do you remember who you were? I remember what I was like before Jesus. I once was lost, I'm now found. I once was blind, now I see. I once was a wretch. And Jesus gave his life for me. He gave his life for you. He gave his life so you and I could be saved, so that we don't have to face him, because I will guarantee you he's coming back. And if you are not right with God when he comes back, you do not want to face him. That's why the Bible gives us this strong language that the, righteous, that the, the great men, the kings of the earth, they will cry out for the rocks to hide them from the face of the lamb who sits upon the, from the face of God. They will cry out for, they don't want to face God. The Bible tells us in Corinthians, Paul said this, that we are the aroma of Christ to those being saved and those perishing. We are the aroma of life unto life to those being saved, and we are the aroma of death unto death to those perishing. We need to smell like Christ to the lost. What do I mean by that? We need to be salt and we need to be light. We need to make sinners recognize that there is a heaven to be gained and a hell to be feared. God is not going to wink at our sin. He will cast us out into darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. We watched, remember, how many of you were here when we watched the, the Bill Weiss video about hell? A lot of you. If you've never watched that video, go to YouTube and look up 23 Minutes in Hell and watch that video. It will scare the H-E double L out of you because you do not want to go there. You do not want your worst enemy to go there. You don't want anybody to go there. But God is warning his people. He's waking up his church. He's calling us to repentance. And I believe he wants the people of God to wake up to the hour we're living in and begin to do what he's called us to do. Because one of the things end time teaching does, one of the things looking for the second coming of Christ does is it causes you to examine your heart. 
It causes you to check up from the neck up. It causes you to recognize that, wow, these things are urgent. These things are, are, are perilous. These are perilous times. These are difficult times because we're facing times that are unprecedented in our nation's history. We're not really sure in America where the next 20 years is going to hold. Years ago when I was a kid, pretty much what had been will be. When I was a kid and we were young, life was pretty secure. You didn't have to worry about sending your kid outside of their house to some crazy lunatic sex addict who was going to abduct them. You didn't have the internet. You didn't have all these things. Though there was wicked things and bad things in the world, but you had none of that like you do today. The world has changed. It's a different world. And I don't think there's any putting the genie back in the bottle unless it all breaks down and falls apart. So you and I really don't entirely know what's going to happen in the next decades. But I will guarantee you this, by just looking at things from the natural as well as the spiritual, this world is changing so rapidly that it may not look anything like you think it looks like it looks right now within 20 years. And so we need to start living with a different mindset rather than just, well, I just think what will be will be. Because that wave is going to come and it's going to hit the shore and it's going to wipe us all out if we do. We have to change our posture. And again, I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying it to prepare you. I'm not giving you a lot of details of things we need to do. I gave you some. We're going to get into this more, but I just don't have time to launch into that this morning. My final message is to us, it's time to seek the Lord. It's call, time to call upon God while he is near. So I'd just like you to bow your heads this morning. So this morning I gave you some really strong meat, some strong words, because you can handle strong meat, uh, strong truth. If you're not right with God this morning, if things aren't right in your life where they need to be, I want to pray for you today. I, I don't want you to let you go outside of that door, which is like, yeah, Pastor Tim had another crazy message. No, it's time to repent if you're not where you need to be with God. If there's things in your life, you know, you know, and then it's not up to me, but it's between you and God, but I want to give you an opportunity to call upon Christ right now. If you've never surrendered to Christ, if you've never repented and turned to Christ, then this is the day. I mean, I don't know how much stronger, more strong I can, I can proclaim these things to us today than what I've done. So today is the day of salvation. Today is the acceptable time. Don't gamble with eternity by not getting right with God right now. So today I want to just ask you, if you need prayer, you say, and I'm not going to call you up here or anything like that, but I just want to pray for you. If you are here today and you say, Pastor Tim, I need to get right with God, I want to just raise your hand. I want to pray with you this morning. Go ahead and raise your hand. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. And we all at times need to repent of things. You know, even me. I need to repent of things at times. So I want to pray for you this morning. Father, I pray for every person that raised their hand today. And maybe those who didn't even raise their hand, but they know they should have. Father, I pray for them right now. Why don't you all stand your feet? And we're, going to st we're going to say a prayer of repentance together. And just repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, you know my heart. You know where I'm at. Nothing's hidden from you. So I ask this morning that you would have mercy upon me, that you would forgive me. I renounce my sin. I renounce the things I've been involved with. I renounce disobedience. And I ask for mercy. I don't deserve it. But you're a merciful father. And I thank you that you give me mercy. And I receive your forgiveness. And now I forgive myself. And I thank you that the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus is renewing me, restoring me, and reviving me. I will live for you by your power, by your strength. Help me to be a faithful servant and help me not to fall. And help me not to fall back into darkness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.